Well, first of all, let me uh, once again just say Happy Mother's Day, and we're so glad to have, I see a lot of uh, new faces this morning, family and, and moms, and we're so glad that you chose to spend this time with us. And I, I want to share something with you real quickly, if I could. Uh, it's always been a, a tradition here at Oakdale, but you know, in a lot of places that uh, we would give some kind of a gift on Mother's Day. And so for years and years and years, you may remember you know, that we would maybe give a, a, a carnation or maybe a, a little pen or a, a little book, something that says, hey mom, you know, we really, we love you, not that much, just this little much. You know, we don't really want to spend a lot on you, but we want you to know we do care. And, uh, and we'd give it to you. And then maybe if it were really an exciting, you know, up-and-coming church, we would have a competition to see what mom, you know, came the furthest or what mom has the most kids on a pew. And, and so a lot of, you know, kind of ungodly competition we would do. And that was always fun as well. So we thought one day, maybe that's not the best way to, to honor our moms. And we came up with something a little bit different. We've been doing this for a few years now. And what we've done is, is that instead of, of buying you some little gift that, that really doesn't even come close to telling you how special you are, um, instead of doing that, what we did was we took that money and we wrote a check. And it's not to you, but it is to the uh, Hope Pregnancy Center of Oklahoma City. The Hope Pregnancy Center is an incredible ministry that we're partners with. And they minister to, uh, to women who are about to have babies and, and are maybe considering abortion and really struggling to figure out what they're going to do and how they're going to handle it. And this ministry is just, again, it's just incredible. And so what we did, we took that money that we would have spent on a little thing for you, and instead we're giving that to the Hope Pregnancy Center in your honor to honor God. And so uh, we really believe that's a, uh, that's a more appropriate way to tell you how much we love you. I, I don't know, you may, you may not like me for this, but moms, would you please stand? Could you do that for us? Please, moms. Let's give our moms a hand. All right, and if they didn't make you breakfast in bed, insist on lunch out today, okay, moms? Do that for us. All right, if you would, let me ask you to do a couple of things. If you have your Bible, I want you to take it out and uh, find Matthew chapter 19. If, uh, uh, if not, we're going to show you the, the Scripture behind me on the screen. And then also I want to encourage you to take out your notes from inside your bulletin, and uh, it'll help you to follow along as we go. We're in the fifth and final week of our spring series called That's Shocking, and we've been learning about some of these very shocking things that Jesus said throughout the Gospels. He said things, crazy things like, you have to drink my blood and eat my flesh to have eternal life. And, and again, if you weren't here for that message, you probably ought to go back and listen because it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense until we're able to explore what all that really means. He said things like, you have to not only love, but pray for your enemies. Uh, and that if your hand or your foot or your eye causes you to stumble, then you're supposed to cut them off or pluck them out. I mean, just some crazy, extremely shocking things that Jesus said. And yet in the middle of each of those shocking statements, we've been able to find an incredible nugget of truth that helps us see the world from God's perspective. Now this morning, for our last shocking statement, we're going to look at something that is very, very controversial that Jesus said about marriage and divorce and remarriage. All right, And, and I want to tell you two things about this, two things that are going to happen. Number one is that it is going to be shocking. Okay, what I'm going to show you this morning is going to be shocking to our system. Number two, uh, you are not going to like it. How's that? How's that for a disclaimer? All right, you're not going to like it. Some of you are going to feel condemned. Some of you are going to feel guilty. Some of you are going to feel incredibly uh, just uncomfortable. Some of you are even going to feel hopeless based on what we're going to learn this morning. It's going to be such a happy time here on Mother's Day. Amen? I mean, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you came? And, and, and here's the thing. Here, I, I have to tell you this. As I've been working through this series over the last couple of months, I knew that I, was I wanted to finish with this, this particular statement about divorce and about remarriage. And I knew it was going to be controversial and I knew it was going to be hard, but I, I felt very confident that this was what I needed to do and this is what God wanted me to say. 
What I did not calculate for was the fact that this was going to fall on Mother's Day, okay? <laughs> I, I could, you know, many of you, you're going to walk out of here hating me this morning, and I, I, I figure at the end, probably not the best day to be doing that. And I'll be honest with you, I tried several times to make myself not do this and to just find something else. You know, I thought, surely, I can, surely there's a Mother's Day sermon rolling around in my head somewhere, one that would make people happy and, and walk out feeling good. And I really did try. I really did attempt to put this aside and not teach it to you. But every time I tried to do that, I just felt like God was bringing me back to it. And in the end, I felt like in order to be obedient, I was going to have to go ahead and, and do what God had put on my heart. So here's what I would ask of you. I want to ask of you to do me one favor. Will you agree to that before I tell you what it is? <laughs> huh? Some of you are saying yes. I'm asking you as your pastor, if you're a guest this morning or a family member, I'm asking you as a guest or family member of, of your church member who goes here, will you, just, will you just promise me one thing? Go ahead, I need you to go like this. Yes, you will. Some of you are like, mm -mm. yes, yes. Will you not leave this morning? Will you not get up and walk out until I'm finished? <laughs> will you, that's all I'm asking. I'm not asking a lot. Okay, I don't have high expectations for how you're going to feel about me when we get done with this. But all I would ask is that you don't leave until we're finished because um, I'm going to begin with something kind of tough, but I promise you, as always, I'm going to end with something wonderful. I'm going to begin with something difficult. I'm going to end with, with grace. And, and maybe, maybe, maybe a new way for us to look at God and to look at our relationship with Him. Here's the thing that, that you have to remember this morning. If you get uncomfortable, or if you get angry, or if you get frustrated with the message today, just remember you're not the first person to ever feel that way. Remember that people turned and walked away from Jesus' teachings all the time. Uh, they, were, they were always going away going, oh, this doesn't make any sense. Oh, I don't, I don't like that. That can't possibly be right. And it drove the disciples crazy. They hated that. They couldn't stand it when people would go away because it just they were people pleasers to the max. And they would go to Jesus. Jesus, can't you say it a different way? And a lot of times Jesus was just stubborn about it. No, th here's how it is. This is how it works. I'm not going to change it for the crowd. In fact, he had a phrase that he used all the time whenever he would present something that was shocking to the crowds. He'd say, if you have ears to hear. Have you ever heard that? If you have ears to hear, basically he would say, you're going to hear what I'm saying and you'll believe it. If you do not have ears to hear, nothing I can say is going to make a difference. You'll never hear it. You'll never believe it. So the question I have for you today as we begin to study something that, again, many of us are not going to like, we're not going to want to believe that this is true. And, and here's the question. Will you at least open your heart to what God wants to say to you, and will you trust Him to show you the truth? I'm not asking you to trust me to show you the truth. I'm asking you to trust Him to show you the truth. Now, some might say, well, if it's so bad, why do we even have to talk about it at all? Right? Right? I mean, if this is so hard and uncomfortable, why not just skip it? And I hear you. I, I promise I do. But let me ask you another question. Do you agree with me that the institution of marriage is in big trouble in the United States of America? I, I believe that it is. I think so too. But unlike a lot of people, brace yourself, I don't think it's because of the judicial system. I don't think it's because of liberals. And I don't think it's because of Hollywood. Now those are easy targets, and, and, and targets that I'm shooting at all the time, to be honest with you. But they're the wrong targets. I'm telling you that the reason marriage is in such trouble in our culture, in our country, in our nation, is because of a generation, generation after generation of Christians who gave up a long time ago on what Jesus said about marriage because it's just too impractical. It's just too hard. And as Christians, we've essentially said, well, here's what Jesus says about marriage and divorce, but there's no way we can live by that. I mean, that's just too impractical. That's just too narrow-minded. So instead of basing what we believe on Scripture, we'll just borrow what the culture says and go with that. Now let me ask you, does that sound like a good idea to you? Does it sound like a good idea to take God's Word and go, eh, I'm not sure about that. Let's let the culture kind of help us decide. Do we honestly want to get our beliefs about what's right and wrong from our culture? 
I don't think we do. And it's essential. It's essential then for us to get them from God's Word. So let me encourage you to open your minds this morning. Let me encourage you to have ears to hear this morning. Stay with me until the very end this morning. And let's see if we can't learn something amazing today. Is that a deal? Will you at least give me, will you give me a shot here today? Okay, fair enough. Let me set this up. We're in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. If you haven't got there, go ahead and find it. Jesus was preaching and, and teaching and healing people in the region of Judea when some Pharisees, these are the religious leaders, they come to Him to test Him on, and, on what He believed about marriage and divorce. And you need to understand about the Pharisees, they're not looking for real information here. Okay, they don't really care what Jesus believes or what He says. What they're trying to do is trap Him into saying something that they can then hold against Him later on. And, and if, you, if you know the stories, you know that they tried to do that again and again and again, and eventually they succeeded. Here's what they say to him, Matthew cha pardon me, chapter 19, verse 3. They said to, to Jesus, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? All right, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? reason. In other words, Jesus, tell us when it's okay for a man to divorce his wife and still be good with God, right? And still be good with society. Give us the specifics in which a man can divorce his wife. And what they were hoping for was that Jesus would say something that was different from what Moses taught in the Old Testament law. If he would do that, they'd have him. They'd have him right where they wanted him, and that's what they were hoping for. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? Now, the question they were asking was, what are the circumstances under which a man could divorce a woman? Is it adultery? Is it violence? Is it disrespect? Is it laziness? Is it bad cooking? We don't know. Jesus tell us. What are the circumstances under which a man could divorce his, his wife? In other words, we know that when we get married, we say forever, but what are the loopholes that would get us out of that contract? That's basically what they're asking. So to answer that question, Jesus says, in the beginning, right? In the beginning. And you've got to wonder, what's he talking about? That's not the question we asked. Why would he say that? Why does he take us back to the first marriage? He goes on in verse 5. For this reason a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become... Say this last part with me. The two shall become one flesh. That's an incredibly important word and phrase. They will become one flesh. The Pharisees ask, under what circumstances can a man divorce a woman? Jesus says, maybe you didn't know this, maybe nobody told you this, but when a man and a woman are married under God's authority and they come together physically, they become one. They become one flesh. Now they don't, do they physically become one flesh? No. They spiritually become one flesh. Two becomes one. In other words, marriage isn't just a license and a honeymoon. All right, there is much, much more to it than that. Oneness. Oneness isn't the goal of marriage. Oneness is the result of marriage. I want you to think about that for a second. Oneness, we say... Man, I'm going to get married someday, got the perfect girl out there for me, got the perfect guy. We're going to have a beautiful wedding. We're going to, you know, we're going to have kids. We're going to have the little house with a picket fence. And, and we're going to uh, just, it's going to be wonderful, live happily ever after. And as we grow in marriage, the goal is, is you know, maybe, I don't know, 10, 15, 25 years, we're going to grow closer and closer until we're just one, right? And we'll be answering one another's you know, or finishing one another's sentences, which some of you guys do. We'll, you know, we'll be able to, when one person has a bad memory, we'll jump in and correct that memory, right, which some of you guys do. And it'll just be so awesome that we're all one. We're going to be one flesh. But see, oneness is not, that's not the goal of marriage. That's not how it works. Oneness is the result of marriage. No matter what your relationship does from that point forward, you have become one flesh with your spouse. The two become something that neither of them were before. 
two becomes one. So, guys, what, what you're really asking, Jesus says to the Pharisees, under what circumstances can two become, or, or rather, can one become two? The Pharisees want to know, how do you take one and split them up and make two? He goes on, verse 6, Jesus says, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, you guys know this part from your wedding, right? Let no one separate. In other words, listen, it, it was God who took two and made one. It was God who put them together. So don't think that man can take them apart. Now do you see, do you see what Jesus is saying? You may not like it. You may see where this is going. But this is what Jesus says. You got one, and you want to know how to make two, but you can't do it because God doesn't do it that way. Here's another way to put it. Don't try to un-one what God has made one. Huh? It took me all week to come up with that. You like that? <laughs> Don't try to un-one what God has made one. That's what the Pharisees were asking Jesus to approve of. That's what they were wanting to know. How do we do this? How do we un-one what God has made one? Now, you want to talk about shocking. All right, think about it. The Pharisees are asking a perfectly legitimate question in that culture. When is divorce permissible? Jesus says, I'm not even sure it's possible. You can't un-one what God has made one. You can't unscramble an egg. You can't separate what God has put together. Jesus is saying when you got married, you made a covenant with God, and He made a covenant with you. And when you decided to get divorced, just because you chose to break your covenant with Him, doesn't mean that He broke His covenant with you. Jesus is basically saying that, that from God's perspective, there is no such thing as divorce. Now, let's, let's, let's pause for a second. Because I see grins on some people's faces and, and big frowns on others. Is there such thing as divorce in the world in which we live? Well, yeah, of course there is. Is there divorce in terms of man's law and, and the way our culture works? Of course there is. What I'm trying to show you is that is not the way God designed it. He didn't, God, well, I won't go that far yet. I want to show you a little bit more. At this point, the Pharisees, when they hear what Jesus says about you can't separate, you can't unwind what one, they start high-fiving one another. That's like, that's it. We got him. That's it. I mean, there's no, you can't beat us now. We got him because we got an ace in the hole. We got Moses and the law. Verse 7. Why then, they asked, did Moses command a man to give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Uh-oh, Jesus, you just been served, right? <laughs> I mean, you, what are you thinking? You know this. You know the law. We've heard you teach before. What are you talking about? There's no divorce. Of course there's divorce. God said it's okay. Moses said give them a, when you, when you get, married, get divorced, give them a divorce certificate. I mean, you can't win this argument. You cannot trump Moses in the law. And Moses said, Moses said, give your wife a divorce certificate. And he did say, send her away with that when you divorce her. But then here's what Jesus says, and I love this. He just kind of stops the party right in its tracks in verse 8. He says this, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Wait, what? You heard me. Moses did not command you to divorce your wives. Go look it up and try to find it. He didn't. He commanded you to give them a divorce certificate when you divorced them, not for your sake, but for the sake of your wives who were being mistreated because of your hard hearts. See, here's what was going on in that culture. The men were kicking their wives out, and their wives had no recourse. Their wives had no choices. Their wives had no ability to take care of themselves. They had no place to go. They couldn't support themselves. So Jesus says, so in order to protect these women, to protect these women, Moses said he issued a certificate of divorce, not because he recognized that somehow one becomes two, but so that a woman would have a legal document that proved she was no longer married, no longer bound to this man who didn't want her and wasn't going to provide for her any longer. And so that she could legally remarry 
so that she would have somebody to provide for her and take care of her. So in issuing a divorce certificate, Moses was not encouraging something. He was doing what he says you should have been doing all along, which was caring for and providing for unprotected women. You see, divorce was not a loophole to get out of a contract. It wasn't a get-out-of-jail-free card. Divorce was a concession to deal with the breakdown of a marriage because men wouldn't take care of their wives. Now, you've got to prepare yourself, all right, because here's... Here comes the kick in the gut. Okay, to this point, don't, and don't look, not quit reading. <laughs> to this point, you're going, eh, not really sure about this. Don't think I like it, but I'm not exactly sure. But okay, we're still okay so far. But you may not feel that way in, in another verse. All right, listen to what he says. Verse 9, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Now, wait a minute, Jesus. <clears throat> Let me see if I got this straight. If a man divorces a woman, and that woman, who potentially did nothing wrong, goes and gets remarried so that she'll have somebody to provide for her, you're saying that's adultery? And then you're saying, because I got divorced once upon a time in you know, what seemed like a different life, right? And I remarried a wonderful person and we lived happily ever after, and you're calling me an adulterer? Well, Jesus, wait a minute. I, I think I know what the problem is. You don't understand the terminology. Okay, you're, you're a little mixed up. Because see, when a person is divorced and they remarry, that's a new marriage. That's not adultery. Right? When you get divorced and then you marry somebody else, that's not adultery. You're, it's just new. It's a new marriage. Two... Divorced people cannot commit adultery because they're not married anymore. Right? So, this cannot be right. This can't be. I mean, there's no way God looks at me as an adulterer. And if that is what God is saying, well, I don't even want to think about how I feel about that. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Jesus, I, I cannot accept that. I cannot believe that's what you're saying. That makes absolutely no sense to me. And Jesus says, well, here's why it makes no sense to you. Because you think a piece of paper unwinds you. But you can't unwind what God has made one. Now, Let's pause just a second. Everybody, let's take a deep breath. Can we do that? I've never heard it so quiet in here before, honestly. <laughs> Sincerely, I've never heard it like that. All right. I mean, honestly, at this point, the implications are they're starting to settle in, aren't they? And they're big. And right now, in your mind, you may be scrambling to figure out a way to make all this my fault, right? I mean, how dare he? How could he? Who does he think he is? What right does he have to tell me? Right? I mean, that cannot be what Jesus means. Except it is. I'm not taking anything out of context. I'm not manipulating any of it. It's simply given, I'm giving it to you exactly as Jesus said it. And there's more. I don't have time to give it all to you, but there's more. But this is the, the, the most basic, the easiest to get. And I want you to understand, I'm on your side. I don't like it either. But I can't just ignore what Jesus said. And what He said was, if you've ever been married, got divorced, and then remarried, you've committed adultery in God's eyes. Now, would you guys agree with me? Here's something you can nod your head at. Would you agree with me that what He's saying seems incredibly cruel? Yes? I mean, it just seems radical. It just seems hard line. It seems cruel. It seems condemning. It's like he's picking on divorced people. He's picking on remarried people, right? And, and, and honestly, you know, every person here this morning who's ever been divorced, who's ever been remarried, I mean, I can only imagine what you feel as you read those verses. And you've got to be thinking, you know, come on, God, come on, Jesus, why, would you do, why are you doing this to me? You know the circumstance. You understand how it was. Why would, why would you say something like this? But I want you to remember something that's very important to remember. 
when you read the Gospels, when you see Jesus dealing with divorced people and remarried people and people who had been caught in adultery, listen, you never see Him being cruel to them, do you? Never. Not once. Ever. When a woman was caught in adultery and brought to Him, Jesus chases off her accusers. And He says to her, look, what you've done is wrong. It's not good. You know that. But I'm not mad at you. I'm not condemning you. I just need to take you back to square one on what marriage is all about. I, want, I need you to agree with me that this is the wrong thing to do because in the beginning it was one man, one woman, forever, and you can't on one what God has made one. So what I want you to do is I want you to ask forgiveness and then I don't want you to ever do this again. Do you remember the story? And he sent her on. There was another time when he got into a conversation with a Samaritan woman at the town well. She was kind of an outcast in the town. She had a bad reputation. And Jesus, you know, he didn't pull a single punch when it came to how he felt about her marital relationships. But when that woman walked away from the well that day, when their conversation was over and she goes back to town, did she go away thinking, that is the cruelest man I've ever met? No, absolutely not. <clears throat> she didn't go away saying, he's so mean, he's so unfair, he's so judgmental. No, this adulterous woman who had been married over and over and over and over again and was not married to the person she was living with went away telling everyone, you've got to come meet this man. He tells the truth like nobody I've ever met. So understand that this shocking statement, it seems so cruel and it seems so unfair compared to what our culture says about divorce. But what I want you to see is that the people who were confronted by Jesus on this, they didn't feel condemned. They didn't feel disrespected at all. They were able to hear the truth spoken in love and in many cases, they were able to experience transformation in their lives. And I wonder if the same thing could be true for you. Let me ask you something. Can you get past the sting of Jesus calling you an adulterer? Can you? Can you get past the anger and the confusion and the guilt and the embarrassment? Do you believe that when Jesus spoke, it was the truth? I need to know, yes or no? Yes? Do you believe that He loves you, yes or no? Yes. Do you believe that He knows what's best and wants what's best for you? Yes or no? Yes. Do you have ears to hear? Do you have ears to hear? Now, those of you who've been divorced and remarried, let me ask you to consider some things. Do you remember when that divorce happened? Do you remember how it felt like your soul was just being ripped apart? Do you remember how for a time you thought you were going to die? You thought, I can't live like, I mean, I can't exist like this. Is it possible you felt that way because you can't unone what God has made one? Do you remember how on the day the divorce was final and you thought, well, that's it. It's over. He's out of my life. She's out of my life. And it's been five or ten or twenty years and they're not out of your life. And it's not like you're going back, but it also feels like you're not exactly moving forward either. Sometimes, does it? Is it possible you felt that way because you can't unone what God has made one? Do you remember when you decided to remarry? And you thought to yourself, I am, this is a fresh start, right? Clean slate, starting over. And you got married, and slowly but surely, some of the same stuff from your first marriage started showing up in your new marriage. And you thought to yourself, how is this possible? I put that behind me. Is it possible you felt that way because you can't unone what God has made one? You say, okay, all right, I guess that's possible. I see what Jesus is saying. That would explain some things that I couldn't explain or that never thought about before. But now what? I mean, now what? What are you saying? What, what is this supposed to mean for me? Where do I stand with God? Well, I'll tell you where you stand with God. You stand where every single one of us in this room stand with God. In need of grace. Alright? You've gone against God's plan. 
Maybe you knew it. Maybe you didn't. Doesn't matter. Sin is sin. But now you have the choice of whether or not to do something about it. You say, well, where do I stand in relation to the church? I mean, you guys know that there are churches that don't allow people who have been divorced and remarried to participate in the church. Do you realize that? They don't allow divorced people to join the church. Where do I stand within this church? That's easy. You stand right alongside every single one of us. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short whether we knew we were at the time or not. Whether we meant to or not. You say, you don't, you don't condemn me? Listen, this is so important. Please don't miss this. If Jesus doesn't condemn you, the church doesn't condemn you. Okay? Remember, the church is the body of Christ. How can we do what Jesus would not do? And as far as I'm concerned, any church that would condemn you isn't a church. Not one of us is different. We are all greatly in need of grace. And so the, the obvious question is, well then what do you do with this? What do you do with this information? Maybe you're freshly divorced and you're dating again and you're going to want to remarry. Maybe you're in your second marriage and it's not going very well. Or you're in your second marriage and it's the greatest thing in the world. You know, am I supposed to feel guilty? What do you want? What, am I supposed to get divorced and go back? I mean, what, 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 do you, what am I supposed to do with this? I'm going to give you three words of potential application here. If I were just talking to you across the table and you were to say to me, Justin, tell me, what, you know, what, how do I do this? What do I do now? I'd say three things to you. Will you write these down? Number one, the first word is admit. Admit this truth. All right, it's uncomfortable, but Jesus, regardless of how I feel, regardless of the details of my situation, regardless of how badly I want to raise my hand and say, you know, but let me tell you my story, right? Regardless of any of that, Jesus, I embrace what you say about the nature of marriage. Jesus, I believe that marriage was created for one man and one woman for life, and you can't unwind what God has made one. And even though I haven't done that, even though I can't do that, I'm not going to avoid what I know is true. I'm going to admit what I know is true. You say, okay, I can do that. I don't like it, but I can't really argue with Jesus. What's next? Well, let me ask you, let me ask you a question. How do you experience the grace of God in any area of your life? How, how do you experience grace no matter what the situation You've got to admit the uncomfortable truth, and then you've got to acknowledge your sin. I acknowledge my sin. You acknowledge your mistakes. You acknowledge your failure. See, the only way to experience the grace of God is to declare your need for it. God, I, I see, I see what, what you wanted, and I see what I did. I recognize it, I agree with it, and I acknowledge the fact that I did not live up to the standard that, that you had for me. And then finally, the most important part is you ask for forgiveness. You ask for forgiveness. Now, before this morning, you may not have even realized that you needed forgiveness. But if you can admit the truth and acknowledge your sin, that's all... The only thing that's left is to fall on His mercy. And let me tell you what can happen at that point. Those of you in a second marriage, you know what you get? Do you know what you get when you do this? When you ad admit and acknowledge and ask? You get second marriage grace. You say, I never heard of second marriage grace. Well, that's because it's not in the Bible. I just made it up. <laughs> And, and yet, I'm telling you, it's real. You do. You get second marriage grace. You say, God, we need you to fill in the gaps in our marriage. Right? God, this may not have started off exactly like you would have wanted it to, but we want to honor you. We want to glorify you in our marriage. God, will you give us second marriage grace to, to go forward in a way that is completely pleasing to you? You say, Justin, will God honor that prayer? Are you kidding me? You, you better believe He'll answer that prayer. He'll answer that prayer every single time. 
Didn't you know that the entire Bible from beginning to end is the story of redemption? Of God taking imperfect, broken things and making something beautiful out of them? You say, Justin, I'm, I'm divorced and single. What do I pray for? Sustaining grace. Right? Sustaining grace. Justin, I'm on my third marriage. Third marriage grace. Fourth marriage grace. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It's the same God. It's the same grace. So the question is, do you want that? I mean, I realized before this morning that, that many of us probably never even thought about it, never even considered it, that we might need grace for our marriage. Do you see your need? Can you admit that need? Can you acknowledge your need? Can you ask for the forgiveness and the grace that God has for you? I want to ask you right now if you just bow your heads. And I recognize that, again, this is, this is difficult. I would just ask you right now just to let God speak to your heart. Maybe you're really, really struggling with this. Maybe you really don't like it. And yet, I'm betting that you're a person who believes that God's Word is true. That believes Jesus is who He said that He was. Can you take your focus off of being hurt? Your focus off of being offended? And put your focus really on where it belongs, which is the fact that God offers you incredible, incredible grace? And let me ask you, don't you want grace for your marriage? Don't you want grace for your family? Don't you want God to just pour out His blessing on you? as a couple, as a mom, as a dad. And right now, why don't you just talk to your Heavenly Father? Can you just say, God, I admit. I see it. I recognize it. I don't like it. But it's in black and white. And I believe that when Jesus spoke it, it was the truth. So I admit it. And God, I acknowledge my sin. I see where I messed up. I see where I took the shortcut. I see where I stumbled. And then finally, God, can I just ask for forgiveness? Can I just receive your grace? God, I could walk out of here today a different person than I walked in. I, could, I can go out with my family know that you've offered me something I couldn't get anywhere else. Your love and mercy and grace.